left on Monday night. People weren't being attentive in the meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. So I don't know if we've got anybody in the public, have we? No. No? Brilliant, thank you. Um, okay. So apologies for absence? No? No. no. Okay, ta. Declarations of interest from anyone? No. Thank you. Minutes of last meeting. Well, two lots of minutes. Everybody's okay with those, yeah? Cool, thank you. Neighbourhood plan, item four. So you've seen a report from the town clerk. Um, is there any comments on that from anybody? Carolyn? Thank you. Can I just ask, is there a housing needs survey going to be produced for this neighbourhood plan? And it, does it going to, is it how, what is the remit of it? Is it going to cover more than just the town or are local villages included? I don't know exactly the answer. Um, I don't know. I have to get back to you, Carolyn. I, I think, Thank you. Yeah, we, we need to wait and see exactly what happens with Valve as well, I think, to know what we need to do next. Okay. Robin? And John. Thank you. I don't know if anyone's got any comments on the response we got to a question on... That's the, next I, that's the next item, Robin. I'm on, the first on the one. other side of the page. I thought it was in it. <laughs> uh, I just took the page over, but we can do that then. Yeah, um, we'll do it in a minute. Like, yeah, do John, it in a minute. Was your, John, was your question on 4.1 or 4.2? John, you're muted. There we go. Sorry. I, I'm not sure whether my comments relate to this item or the next one because they are both in, intricately intertwined. But obviously, I agree with the, the, with the main premise that, um, that we should not start developing our, well, we should not try really advancing on our neighborhood plan until there's something in place that, that our neighborhood plan can refine with local needs, which is how I would see our neighborhood plan acting within the new Vale of Aylesbury plan or indeed a Buckinghamshire wide plan. The concern I've got though is how the world has changed in the last few months um, and I think it's going to have a huge housing impact because I think the whole idea around people commuting uh, and or in a sense working from home is now much 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 more uh, prevalent than ever before and I think the whole shape of of towns, the whole shape of, of where people live and with regards to where they work has changed. And I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to go back to where it was. And I guess my question would be is whether we as a council should write to the Buckinghamshire Council and say when they advance on the Vale of Ellesby local plan, are they simply going to carry on doing it, even though the premises on which it's now built have seriously changed? Because if the premises have changed, then surely the whole plan needs to change um, as well. Um, otherwise, it's going to be out of date, more or less as soon as it's published. It's already out of date, in effect. Are you on about the VALP or the Buckinghamshire plan? Um, well, the VALP is the first one that they are pursuing, isn't it? Yeah. So it's it about, you know, I, I think, you know, we can't advance on ours until the VALP is ratified. I'm now saying, should the VALP even be ratified? Because, mm. frankly, it's now out of date because the premises on which it was built are now expired. Yeah. And I think we as a council should at least ask the Buckinghamshire Council who are still advancing on the valve as to whether they really should be advancing on the valve. That's my view. No, and that's a good point, John. Right, members are okay, we can go on to 4.2 and then, um, right, Robin, did you want to take this one away? Uh, Mark has a hand as well. Oh, sorry. Um, right, who was first then? Well, I'd say I'd say Robin was first because he it's yeah we'll go to Robin first then Mark. Well firstly nothing stands still um, planning's evolving um, there's questions that Mark raised in another meeting with South Bucks plan there's questions with the Vale plan I don't think the world's very certain um, there's also questions about 
which Paul didn't give a straight yes or no answer to about involving the parishes. Now, Mark put a lot of work into that, and I don't want to premise what Mark did. Um, he can speak better than that. But we, housing need, and the way we pursue housing need in our local plan, my understanding is we can define that if we can prove it. Um, what I mean is we can define a housing need being affordability because the Vale plan is handicapped by its 25% affordable housing, which actually means diddly squat for residents. Mm. So it's always been flawed. I, I put an amendment to it. The only person who put any amendments to that plan at District Council historically to amend both that and to not accept um, the land at... Um, another piece of land into the development plan away from um, mm. industrial. That was voted down. Um, yeah. So we are sort of stuck with this sort of cobbled together plan, which has had many lives and many journeys and hasn't actually got an inspector to sign off on it yet. And it's yeah. still out there, isn't it? So mm. I think we do need to start thinking about if we were doing a plan, what we want it to do and how wide we would want it to go. And I think we have to define as a council where we want to include people. We have to agree that we want to include people because it's so evident that many of the villages around Buckingham haven't got a develop, local development plan. Yeah. We have to define if, and we haven't really got the answer yet, have we? If the Vale of Housing Plan doesn't go through, we have a time to presumably do a development plan for Buckingham, of which, if it's accepted, would then steer, I presume in law, somebody tell me if I'm wrong, would then mean that the Vale of, or the Buckinghamshire plan would have to take on the points in the Buckingham neighbourhood plan, because it would be a planning document that it would have to adhere to. So I don't think it's a yes or a no answer here. And I know we need to know what happens with the Vale plan, but I don't think we should stop talking to parishes because it's only recently mm -hmm. in recent history Tindrit had an application outside its um, yeah. curtilage which fortunately went away um, if the expressway comes close to Buckingham there will be um, opportunities for developers to try and get land into the development plan yeah. and there's a lot of people around Buckingham who aren't anywhere near very well placed for that and the Buckinghamshire plan, even if they stop doing it, that isn't going to happen and for quite some time, is it? No. So we, we either have to strengthen our local plan and revise it or sit back and wait for whatever comes our way. And I don't think we, we're in okay. a position to do that. Uh, I'm interested in other members' view on that. because Yeah, so am I. Know, yeah. you know, because I'm not Thanks, happy yeah. to sit still quiet and watch so. the whole of... Um, North Buckinghamshire round us immediate where we have influence disappear yeah. on the tarmac unless it's got affordable houses in it. Um, yeah. I don't really right. want, you know, that's Thanks, where I'm Robin. coming from. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mark. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, um, I agree with the recommendation of our, our clerk that uh, we continue the current process of preparing to revise the neighbourhood plan. It's a work in progress. We can we can work on it. We think about it, add to it all the time. Sheena's quietly working in the background. But I also agree with John's point, which is a very well made point, that Elsie Vale plan may never happen. It could be two years down the road. It might be three years down the road. And yet Buckinghamshire Council wants to have its countywide plan in place by 2025. So I think we're going to have to go on the premise that it might not happen. Look around us, look what's happening. Look down at Slough, all the unmet housing needs they're trying to push into Buckinghamshire. Look at Bedford, Luton, they're in big trouble now. You've probably all seen that Luton uh, Corporation is, is suffering now because of the losses on the airport, which they own, and it's dragging the whole council down. That council could go into administration in the next year or so. We don't know. And that means we got more problems because they're one of our neighbours. So there's a lot of things happening out there, as John says, and we're, we're going to have to go with the flow at the moment. But yes, continue working on our plan, but don't assume that we ever will have a new Aylesby Vale plan. Thank you. I'll second that. that. Thanks, John. Is there any That's other comment? I didn't leave the meeting. I went to pick up an agenda from the That's front. That's all right, Robin. That's, That's fine. That's fine. 
Right, is there anybody else wants to speak about the question from Robin? Yes, Ma Martin has a hand up. <laughs> Martin. <laughs> I thought it got lost in the background then again. <laughs> um, really, it was a, a combined question for uh, both Mark and John on uh, the way you uh, spoke. What do you think in the plans will need to be adjusted because of the possibility of more people working from home? Okay, John, did you want to pick that one up? Me well, I, think, I mean, to quote an example, from a friend of mine, his daughter works for a company based in, I think, Hemel Hempstead. Um, and she was looking for housing near Hemel Hempstead so that she could continue to work for the company she's been working for and have a short commute. But now that, now that she's got used, as indeed all of her colleagues have got used to working from home on a regular basis, with perhaps in the future maybe a visit once a week, um, then she was saying to her father, my old mate, um, well, she might live anywhere then in a sense, because mm. if she can actually just have to go into, into, into work once a week, living in Aylesbury or living in Luton or living in wherever, in a sense, it almost becomes academic because, you know, most of us can do what, I mean, I knew a chap at the home office, uh, civil service rather, who used to live in Helsinki. And he would, he would, he would uh, go home on a Thursday evening, uh, spend a long weekend in Helsinki doing a bit of work from home on the Friday and fly back on the red eye on Monday morning. So I think people now are making, will be making different choices. And that's going to have to have an impact upon where people need housing. They may well choose to, have, to, to live here in Buckingham because Buckingham is still a lot cheaper, of course, than, say, Chesham. And a right. lot of the housing need uh, is determined by people's commuter belt. The whole green belt system is determined by commuter belt. And I think we might begin to see the end of that, which means then the pressure on the green belt begins to change. I, I haven't fully thought this through. I'm just pretty sure that the premises on which a lot of the, on which a lot of the housing plans are built have now changed and will not change back. No, thank, thank you for that, John. Uh, yeah, I think that's um, that's crystal clear now in explaining how people's um, um, transition and moving around mm. may affect our housing stock and requirements. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Right, so take Carolyn and then Robin. Thank you. I was just going to add to that, really, by saying the critical thing here is actually broadband use. Uh, unless uh, the broadband is up to speed and fast, people aren't going to want to move anywhere except where you can get good broadband. And of course, at the moment, uh, well, we haven't got good broadband. Milton Keynes has very superior broadband. And that's the sort of thing that I think must be included in any neighborhood plan, scope, local plan, what have you, is, is an emphasis on bringing good, fast broadband to everyone. Very good point, Carolyn. Right, Robin and Anthony. Carol, I mentioned my first point, which was broadband. My other point is education. Mm. Um, you know, um, the idea that people should be ferried all around um, everywhere for education and the fact that we need to make sure that there's appropriate scale buildings built because if we are going to live in a society where people are going to be more dependent on going to school. We can't have really small classrooms constructed. Um, there's no way to so safe distance in those classrooms. And we can't presume there'll be a vaccine within the next period. We may be living with this before. So we have to make sure design of buildings cope with that for children. The other thing is we have to, it may be the way people use their vehicles will change and the way people use public transport will change, that will evolve. Mm -hmm. But the one thing we do have to make sure is that in all what we do, we take that opportunity to improve the environmental standards of houses, the way yeah. that they, um, their footprint, um, mm -hmm. the way they don't use carbon. Um, many of the houses going up now, are they not dissimilar to houses from a previous decade? Mm. Um, there are best practices in, which could be applied and I don't know whether there's any strength in planning law but we should try to make sure that the houses that are developed in Buckingham off-way the houses which are of an older period and lower the carbon footprint surely. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And and yeah. that can be done by many ways that we do it, you know, okay. and that needs to be Thank considered. You. What they are are too long to talk about, but I think we need to consider yeah, that. Definitely. All right. Thanks, Robin. Mark, did you have your hand up at one point? Oh, no, Anthony. That was right. Thank you, Chair. Um, talking about housing stock, of course, if uh, people are working for home, perhaps two people, uh, salary or wage earners, then they want a bit more room because they'll tend to want a study or a place to work. Mm. And so it's likely that the layouts and the requirements of houses will change and that in turn will have an effect on um, mm. how we develop locally as well. So one has to keep a weather eye on so many things. Yeah, good point. Okay, right, are we okay to move on now? Can I just add another couple of points, Chair? Yeah. Yes, you may, John. Um, just to say, I mean, we've experienced already the issue of broadband we've just been mentioning in Lace Hill, that Lace mm-hmm. Hill was built without there being connectivity built in to the, um, you know, to, the, to all the plots. Mm-hmm. And that was a serious mistake by ABDC that they failed to actually put that in as a requirement for the planning, uh, the planning for the whole estate. I hope they put it into place for the uh, developments on Tingerick Road and, and so forth. Um, and I think that's a really, really important point that we need to build into our plan as we revise that. Yeah. And I also think that given that the, the, the biophysics of the virus is probably, are probably not going to go away, then my view is, and there's plenty of, there's, there's emerging research on this, is that being outdoors, even on crowded beaches like Bournemouth or in crowded demonstrations like BLM in London and so on, don't mm-hmm. tend to yield spikes in infections because being outdoors is actually quite a good way of avoiding of re- or at least reducing the risk. And I think we need far more indoor outdoor spaces as it were. And I think I can see housing being built, which will actually have build in, I don't know, you know, you know, like the pubs have the kind of smoking areas where they're meant to have lots of open, um, you know, space where people who are smoking can go, but still be out of the rain. I think those sort of spaces will become far more common in people's houses as well. So the friends can go around, without having to stay inside in still air, but be semi outside um, and, and not get infected. And I'd like to see that more in public places um, as well. Um, and lastly, I'll just return to the broadband. If only there'd been a political party in the last election, it would actually offer free board, fast broadband for everybody. Wouldn't that be a good idea, eh? <laughs> uh, Catherine? Um, I'll point out that the existing plan already has some grey water recycling into it. Um, it insists on all new estates to have broadband. Lace Hill was pre-planned, so we missed that one. But um, it is actually written into our current neighbourhood plan, good broadband. And if nothing else comes out of this virus thing, an awful lot of MPs will find just how rubbish rural broadband is because they've been <laughs> living there. <laughs> good point. <laughs> Oh dear. Right. Okay, we're okay to move on now. Yeah. Do we need a vote, Madam we, Chairman? We didn't agree on whether oh, the, yeah. the recommendation. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, right. I seconded Mark's proposal. You did, yeah. All right. So can we have hands up that agree to a proposal, please? That's unanimous. Thank you, everyone. And the letter that Councillor Harvey suggested we write to County? Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I can't see anybody having an issue with that one. Yeah. I just Thank need to you. action on my notes, that's all. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, so we're now on, on to action reports now. Appendix B. Has anybody got anything they'd like to say on that? Oh, hold on, let's turn my phone off. I didn't understand oh. that. <laughs> oh gosh. Right, has anybody got anything on the action reports? Uh, Robin? I started to talk about Appendix A and you said we'll do that next and now you've gone on to Appendix B. We've done I said A. A Joe, and you said they're very much related. No, I've done I it. We've done it. That's no, what we've just worry. done. No, nobody commented on the comments in regards to. No, I, I asked. I said, does anybody have any comments uh, on the. I apologise, apologise, not a point. <laughs> <laughs> just not a place. 
<laughs> shouldn't leave your settee, Councillor Stutchbury. <laughs> Pardon? What was that, Catherine? What that? You shouldn't have left your settee. Well, I went to pick up a... That's probably when I picked up my parcel from Buckingham Fire Authority, wasn't it? That, okay. that is my reading. All right, thanks, Robin. <laughs> right, Appendix B, actual reports. Is there any, anybody got anything to say on that? No. Oh, I think it going off. Stop. Okay, on to Appendix C, plan applications. And Appendix D, we take those two together. So has anybody got anything? Oh, actually, the, the panic C and D are to do with the planned applications. So oh, is everybody happy to move straight on to planned applications? Yep. Yep. Cool. Right. So we've got 6.1 is nine feet close. Anybody got any comments on nine feet close? John? Yeah, I don't have any objections to this. Um, I think this is, I mean, it, 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 it is extensive, I guess, and they obviously have done various extensions and so on. And, uh, but I don't think it's going to have any impact. And my view is why not? Okay, thank you. Is that general consensus? No objections to this application? Robin? I obviously would be abstaining from it for one or two reasons. One, it's named after my late brother-in-law's father, Frank Fleet, who was Borough Mayor of Buckingham. So, but I would abstain from it, so I'm going to vote on it elsewhere. Thank you. All right, so no objections to this application. Is everybody happy with that? I'll yep. abstain if I may, Chairman. You may, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would want to abstain from this? No. All right, so no objections to that one. Okay, item 6.2 is 10 Hilltop Avenue. Mark? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, um, this application, which is a retrospective one for fencing around a corner of um, a road, has been dragging on now since September 2018. Um, the applicant put the fencing up unaware that permitted development rights have been removed. Um, we reported it to enforcement. Enforcement eventually got round to doing something about it. Um, she then was refused on the first application, although she claims, the applicant claims, she wasn't aware it had been refused, so she didn't take the fence down. Um, she was told by planning enforcement at Aylesbury on the 29th of May that she should submit a new application, and the enforcement officer came to an agreement with her that the owner would now apply for a revised scheme for the fence it should be of a more open design with some landscaping mitigation being mm. implemented well that's the application we've got before us now there is no change to the design of the fence it's not more open it's still closed fencing it's been dropped by um from 1.8 to 1.6 meters at one point so it matches the wall there's also an application for a shed of 2.3 meters height to go in, uh, sorry, 2.2 meters height to go in behind that fence. And this is all on the corner of an open plan estate. Um, so she's not come up with what she said she was going to do. The reason we originally refused this and we were backed by Aylesbury on this under their policy GP35 is the virtue of material scale and location on a corner plot would result in an overly dominant structure that fails to respect and thus unacceptably harm the open character of the area and appear visually prominent within the street scene, failing to respect the character and appearance of the locality. Even her agent acknowledges that's why it was turned down the first time. Nothing's mm -hmm. changed. They just fiddled a bit. So for that reason, I propose that we continue to oppose and attend on those grounds. Yeah, I'm more than happy with that. Is anybody got anything they wish to say on this one? John. John? I'd agree with Councillor Cole. Mm. I think we continue to object. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Robin? I'll abstain then because I'm going to see it again. Thank you. Okay, so is everybody happy that we object to this one? Yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody that would like to abstain from it? No. Okay, thank you. Yes, 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. 6.3 is 14 at Gilbert Scott Road. Two metre high fence. John. Does anybody like to speak on this one? Sorry, Paul. John has his hand up. Thank you. John? I'm, I'm not happy with this. I think this is destroying the street scene and what appears to be a very open uh, piece of land. I, I mean, I assume the applicant owns this land, but it just seems to suddenly change the whole nature of, of that particular road. Um, and to in order to install some more uh, parking, it seems mostly. So my view is we object on the basis that it's street scene and, and overdevelopment. I don't know if those would stand. I'd look for the advice of of our planning officer. Mm. Yeah, I was going to ask Catherine for you. Can we have some input on that, Catherine, please? Um, well, I haven't been at, actually up there to look. Uh, it looks as though the garage is quite small and quite difficult to get in because you're going to do a U-bend in off the end of the road. They do own the Verge. They have owned it for a considerable time. Um, and it's right at the end of a cul-de-sac. And at the end of the cul-de-sac is what might turn out to be Morton Road 3 at some point. <laughs> um, I think you might have a difficulty arguing that it's going to affect the street scene radically. And there okay. are, I mean, there are no um, neighbour comments. Um, members might remember we had one in Bradfield Avenue last meeting or the meeting before. Mm. And it is actually straight opposite that but it is right at the end of a short stub of a cul-de-sac. Okay. All right, so are we happy? To, oh, sorry, John. Um, well, Mark needs to come in, but just to, just to address the point um, of what Catherine has said. I mean, it is at the end of a cul-de-sac, but that is a turning point, isn't it? Those, the, that, that, that the end where they're going to put the garage uh, is surely a point where they, people are being able to turn. Will it, will it interrupt that? I wouldn't have said so because anybody going that far is aiming for a, a drive and the little bit where they turn off is a garage court for the other bungalow and the next house over. So, okay. I mean, it's difficult without actually having gone up there and actually looked at it on the ground. Going by Google, which isn't always up to date, isn't perfect. But um, I think we'd have difficulty arguing it. I can make the comment, but I don't know that, the, I mean, the officers are now able to pretty well overrule us, so. Martin's got a hand, as has Mark. Okay, Who's, who was first, Martin or Mark? I think I, I've, I was from the oh. start of this. Um, yes, Mark. I, I think Catherine's quite right. I don't think this is going to affect the street scene greatly. It, it might People might be misreading this. On the plan that we see, it's got a red line around it. That mm -hmm. is only the delineation of what property they own. That's not the development. All they're doing is bringing the side of the house out by um, 3.6 metres from the side of the house. They're not going to fill in that nice green area in the front they're just going to encroach onto it so I don't think it's actually a problem and as Catherine says it is a cul-de-sac um, and I don't think it's it's something worth fighting for I, I think mm. if these people want a garage there they're going to get the car cars off the road into a garage great well done and uh, I don't think it's going to affect the street scene they're not 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 erecting a garage they're just actually making a dropped curb and parking bays yeah parking bay then yeah so there's not nothing much above ground than a curbstone, really. Yeah. Mm. So I should have said I should have said parking space, not garage. Sorry. Yeah. I agree with yeah. Councillor Cole. Thanks, Andy. Martin. Yeah, there's a bit of a difference in um, wording here. Within the uh, uh, close-up of the red line, it says match the existing one-point high uh, brick wall. Um. Mm. And then just below it says to replace a garden wall with two meters high in timber close fence. Mm. 
if Councillor Tri cares to look slightly above this picture, it says a previous application extended the bungalow to the side and acquired open space land, building a brick wall around the curtilage. Thank you very much. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> <laughs> OK, right. So we get no objections on this I'll one. I'll line yeah. them up. You can tell them. Yeah. <laughs> can no we objection. have a show of hands for no objections for this one, please? Sorry, you're muted, Paul. That's unanimous, apart from Councillor Stutchbury. OK, thank you very much. And you're abstaining, aren't you, Robin? Yeah, cool. OK, our next one is number three, Burley Peace. Item 6.4. Who would like to speak on this one? Carolyn? Thank you. Um, yes, interestingly, I remember noting that the tiny little window they previously inserted wasn't going to give much light or air to the room that they were proposing. Really, my question is, and I couldn't see this from any of the plans, is whether the house opposite, number five, I think it is, whether it has a window on that wall. Because if there's not a window on the wall, there obviously isn't much of an issue. Yeah, I did have a similar thought, actually. Catherine, do you know? I don't know. Um, the, the, that part of Linden Village is so old that the original drawings are not available anymore on the website, which is where I would have looked if I could have seen what house style it was. I could have looked at the plans and that would have told me, but uh, I'm not getting out much. <laughs> mm. I'm not, I mean, even strolling down there to have a look, I didn't. And you can't get Google rightly angled to look at that wall because it's close to the number three. Yeah. Yeah. John has a hand. Thank you. John? My hunch would be that if there is a side window, it would be a window for a bathroom and would be frosted anyway, would be my hunch. Mm. Yeah, I'd probably guess that. Anthony? Um, this is a bit, um, how, how shall I put it, um, just asking for technical information, but one of the planning uh, drawings uh, which was showing a plan view had an indication of the 45% angle for a window not to encroach on the lights of the next property, which is a fairly standard thing. I wondered if any of my colleagues here uh, or Catherine could advise me where that line comes because on various different things I've seen it drawn from the edge of a building from the center of a window and from the closest edge of a window to the next property I wonder if there is a rule about that that we can uh, that we can uh, know of usual practice is to go to the center of the window not everybody obeys well, ah, yes, yes, yes. I, I wasn't actually looking for that degree of purity, really. <laughs> I just wanted a general sort of rule of thumb. Thank you, Mrs. E. All right. Has anybody else got any comments on this application? Mark has his hand. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, just simply to say that. Uh, this hasn't yet been advertised in the area. Um, it's, it's the most recent application we have before us. And I think Catherine said it's only a week old. So um, if the next door neighbour had an objection, then that's, yeah. that would be the time to do it. So I think we could put a proviso in, providing there is no window on that aspect of number five. Agreed. Yeah, and no objections are usual. Yeah, yeah usual for Pope. Yeah. All right, so we're happy to go with no objections on this one. Yep. May I ask another question? You may. Just for interest, really. So, um, Catherine, if there was a window, or who gets first pick them? Because we're saying we can put a window in, as long as there's nothing the other side. But what happens if the reciprocal happens, and they want to put a window in? Do we say, tough, you're, you're the second one here? <laughs> oh, no. It's a first come, first serve system. <laughs> All right. If the neighbour decides they want a big window there as well, um, they're a bit late because they're. Okay. 
It's a bedroom, you see. It's a habitable room. It's not a bathroom or a landing. Hmm. And Thank I, you very much. I agree with Carolyn. That was a really tiny window for a bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you thank you okay okay 6.5 if wisteria cottage on morton road anybody got any comments on this one john has a hand john then mark yeah having looked at this i think they, they've listened to what we said they've reversed the angle of the uh, the roof lights i see no reason to object yeah thank you mark yeah, I would have been ditto. Um, again, we're being listened. We're being listened to, which is a great thing to hear. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so no objections to this one. Yeah. Andy has a hand. Sorry. Uh, Andy has a hand. No, oh, no, no, that's no objections. I thought you were taking. Oh, sorry. A vote. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can we just do show hands for that? So no objections. Uh, my, my my hand is up, but I've gone dark. One, two, three. Hang on. Hang on. Okay, come back. Yep. One, two, three, four, five. I make that. Robin's going to abstain. I Paul, Paul did have his hand up. No objections. He's not voting. John, are you abstaining or? Oh, you're muted, John. You're muted. Oh, he's, he's voting no objections. Yeah, I'm all, I, I thought I'd already said, I proposed it, that we'd no objections. Yes, I didn't know I'd vote as well. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, our next one is 21 Beach Clothes. Has anybody got any objections to this? Or are we going to get no objections? No hands up. No. Okay, so hands up for no objections. That's everybody except for Robin. Thank you. Robin, you're abstaining, yeah? Cool, thank you. Okay, 11 Cromwell Court. These are protected oh. trees. John and Mark have their hands. Thank you very much. So John and Mark, please. Um, well, probably Mark and I are in agreement on this. Seriously, what I mean, I I, I want to see a, a full report um, about this. I, I I I can't quite believe that trees would affect a house from that distance away. You know, tree roots don't tend. Uh, so I, I I'm concerned that there are these fallacious reasons for cutting these trees down. Yeah, I think you echo that across a few other councillors, but <laughs> we'll let Mark and then Robin. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as John says, they are so far from the <laughs> property. There's a public footpath between these three listed trees and the wall. And then th there's another gap from the wall to the garage of the property. Then the house is the other side of the garage. Mm. I, I took a tape measure up there. It's actually six metres from the closest of the trees to the, the garage. And there's no way the roots could affect it in any way. The footpath hasn't been affected by these trees. They've been there since 1976. They are a feature of the entrance to the school there, the Buckingham mm -hmm. Primary School in Foscott Way. All these trees are quite pretty trees. These are, these are particularly nice maples. Um, and this is an absolute no-no. It's just an insurance job to try and prevent anything possible happening in the future. And as I think people will agree, you know, insurers normally hope a council will roll over and die and rather mm -hmm. than uh, block them from doing what they want. So absolutely not. Yeah. Okay, Robin. <clears throat> I don't say any more than what Mark said on that basis, but there is something here called a precedent. If we accept that TPOs in mm. the new authority can be rolled over yeah that, that's a precedent and then when we come to another decision somewhere else they can quote that this was done because of x y and z i yeah. think it's something that the new authority has got to determine whether it's going to defend tpos or whether it's going to roll over um and if it's going to roll over buckingham's one of the greenest towns in buckinghamshire mm. um and we don't really want to see our skyline out dramatically, do we? So yeah. I would 
whatever you decide, I would propose that we seek um, a letter of understanding from, from the authority what their position is as a new council on defending um, tree preservation orders. I, I believe, unless Catherine tells me I'm wrong, these have got tree preservation orders on them. Yeah, um, two of the three have, yes. So it's quite important because if you were to carry this out and you work through the town, mm. uh, anyone was to say, well, that got rid of those trees then, didn't it? Yeah. Um, but they're not put there for today. They're When they're planted, they're put there for future generations, aren't they? Mm. And, and, and the fissure of Buckingham would have changed years ago if there was never tree preservation orders. Yeah. We wouldn't have all the trees we have got, wouldn't mm. we? So I think we need to find what the council's position is on this. Are they going to defend it? Because they're not going to defend it. That means we could lose the whole curtilage in the green environment. I don't think that would be the case. But I think okay. we should ask. Thank you, Robin. Paul, you got your hand up? Um, has anyone asked Lee about the whole business of how far routes can affect? It is actually further than you might think, and it depends what they are. Some do, because I had some... My next door neighbour had some and complaining about one of my trees, which was quite a long way away and said, well, you know, that, that they do, in fact, affect this far. And I just wondered what, you know, Lee, after all, mm. is supposed to be a bit of an expert on trees. Mm. I would have thought he mm. would have been useful to get his opinion on this. Lee's... Lee's opinion is, one, it's a clay soil and clay soil heaves because it doesn't drain fast, it accumulates water and drains slowly so that it will actually move just with soil, whether it's got a tree in it or not. Um, and a tree's root run is normally calculated as about the same as its branches if it's allowed to grow free. Okay, so you... So it's called the drip line. You can draw a circle around a tree where the ends of the branches drip. Mm, yeah, okay. And these, these are nowhere near, as Councillor Curl says. Yeah. We've got yeah. another one next meeting in Midsmorton Avenue that they want to fell because it's causing subsidence. Okay. All right, John. Has has a hand. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Um, um, I was going to say that this has been a particularly busy year, and I think a lot of. Are you, am I turned on? Yes, I am. So yes. it's a very dry year. I think there's probably been a lot of sort of subsidence due to land just drying out. You know, I've seen lots of trees being blown over because their roots have just, you know, the, the ground which the roots are in is just too dry to sustain the trees. So I think if there are problems with subsidence, to blame a tree is the wrong thing. You, you've, you've, mm. It's to do with the climate and to do with um, the weather this year. It's nothing mm. to do with the trees. Yeah, thank you. All right, so um, are we happy <coughs> not to change? Sorry. <coughs> Who's that? Martin, sorry. The guy that doesn't have to move his hand again. <laughs> Martin. <laughs> I'm sure it's the movement. He's got a, a moving sensor on his uh, Zoom. <laughs> um, no, I don't. Th I think um, we ought to object to this, but it is interesting in their number one point, or the point number one, that it says differential foundation. And I'm wondering whether they've seen a difference in some sort of movement between the house, which I think around here was on a floating base. And maybe uh, their conservatory or garage, which will have been on a different floating base. Um, because as been said, you don't normally get a, um, uh, uh, an insurance claim if it's about to happen, it's probably has happened. Um, so, yes, I agree with all the other um, uh, councillors' uh, thoughts on, on this matter. Something we need to keep, a, keep be keep, kept an eye on, though, mm. with uh, these trees. Yeah, As I say, in, in um, Berkshire, I think they're looking at 10 metre from a tree. Where my sister lives because she she's gone through this uh, and they've agreed it is to do with the tree and that is about uh nine meters away bigger than the canopy yeah because it's not the roots that's affecting it it's it's a it's now a big tree you know um 
and the roots are then sucking the water up from the clay, which, as uh, has been said, is making uh, other issues. Mm. Yeah. And Robin, okay. other hand. Thank you, Robin. Climate is, the climate is changed, everyone says, but this is something mm -hmm. that when we're putting into our new development plan, we've got to be minded of making it got some longevity in it and putting things in there like root guards in development next to trees which get put in with the houses mm. and things like that to try because otherwise in 50 to 60 years time whoever's doing this job if we're mm. still allowed to meet um by 50 years time no, um, i think a good point we, we need to make sure that we add this into development plans because otherwise people will buy a house or second time round, and then they'll find the whole reason they moved there has been moved because it prejudices somebody else. So I think it needs to be considered in the outline planning of these houses to make sure that the tree species are appropriate, they're not mm -hmm. prejudicial, and they are ones that can sustain the drought, then you won't get all these problems. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're, so we're sticking with object to this application. Can I show our hands for that, please? That's everyone except for Robin. You're abstaining, Robin. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> 64 Borton Road is our next one. Would anybody like to say anything on this? No, I can't see any hands up. No. So we're going with no objections to this one. Can we have the show of hands for no objections? please. That's everyone except for Robin. Thank you. Robin's abstaining. Okay, so we're on to item seven, planning decisions. Um, I'd like to say for the record that I know members, I know our members are happy that uh, comments that we've um, given to two of these applications were taken on board. Um, I think it was the 110 Western Avenue and the 23 Hilltop Avenue ones. So it is nice to um, see that our comments are making their way down the chain and being taken on board. Has anybody got anything they'd like to say on item seven? Mark has his hand. Thank you, Mark. Yes, the, uh, hearing what you're saying, Madam Chairman, there does seem to be a sea change now down at Aylesbury in planning. Um, Catherine's obviously getting much more feedback. She's got better relationships with the people down there. They're coming back to her quickly. Um, and I think they're listening to us now. And I, I think they've taken on board that Buckingham and the and North Bucks are a very special area uh, compared with the former town and uh, district councils in the south of the county who didn't seem to make as much noise as we did so I think this is very very positive and uh, long mm. may this continue. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay so um, we're going straight on to eight. Oh yeah because they're all under seven. Okay so item eight. So we've got eight point one point one the councils, the Shire Council's enforcement policy. Would anybody like to say anything on this item? John has his hand. John. Um, just to say, we look forward to implementation because that was always the problem before, wasn't it really? It's great mm -hmm. having a policy. Will they actually resource it properly? And will they evaluate the policy mm -hmm. as to whether it actually is working? Because all councils should be driven by evidence-based practice. So I, I I guess I would like to see a commitment to actual implementation and the commitment to evaluation of the of the policy itself a year or two down the track. Our our councils have been very good at bringing in new policies. They haven't been altogether very good at then implementing them, and indeed pretty shabby at actually evaluating them. So it's really important that we ask them to e evaluate this policy and how they're going to evaluate the policy. And what I'd like to see is some baseline measures against which they can they can show progress. I and mean, I pressed you know, one of our local councillors about this continually with regards to the uh, children's centres, and I've mm. got precisely nowhere. We need baseline figures. Yeah. 
Good point. Hey, Robin. All I can say is um, the problems that the Buckingham Society raised at the last meeting has generated, uh, or was it the meeting before, Caroline? I apologise if it was. Um, um, was has been generated in no time at all, and that's driven a case forward for enforcement. What we have to understand is many of these things, because it's it's now in my name the enforcement because I'm raising it on behalf of people. But um, mm -hmm. but I do think that we have to have another discussion with the new authority. I think on how we can measure enforcement because. I can only demonstrate that that was the one thing I've done on that, and that was dealt with very quickly. So I think they were dealt with very quickly. It's it's how quick they actually get to round thereafter. So I, I think that we need to find out in many ways what they're going to be doing to communicate their success or their decisions to us because they are under, because of the data things, you can generate a um, data thing against yourself if you give it out and you can bring other people into it if you include them. So but we need to do that. I mean, I know Catherine's got around it. She's probably going to tell yeah. me I was wrong or something. Um, <laughs> okay, thanks, Robin. Catherine? Um, I did pick up on a point in this document that said that they were going to report back. And I did ask and say, is, does this mean you're going back to the monthly bulletins we used to get of enforcement cases, new ones, closed ones, and the reasons? And they're not going to go back to that, but they will be reporting back to parishes on a regular basis. But they haven't really, I don't think they've really thought it through yet. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Um, 8.2. Uh, we've got John and Mark. Sorry, Sorry John and Mark. <clears throat> um, just picking up on what Catherine just said, uh, regular could mean every 10 years. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think we've got to keep, we've got to watch this space. We've yeah. now got a pretty comprehensive document against which we can um, evaluate their performance. But I really think it's important that they evaluate their performance. Mm. They've been very clear as to what the, the purpose of the policy is. There they say, let me quote it here, the purpose of the planning enforcement service is to investigate alleged breaches of planning control, taking enforcement action where appropriate. The aim of the service is to remedy planning harm caused by breaches of planning control. Those are all measurable outcomes that they could start measuring now and we yep. could see whether it's made any effect and impact a year from now or two years from now. Mm. Yeah, good point. Um, was it Mark that was next? No? Okay. All right, well, then we're going to move on. One of the things I think what drove the failure where we was was resource. When I say resource, if the, there was a great budgetary thing where it was decided at our, of our district council when they rearranged all the planning department and everything else that there was so much money allocated per case for planning, so much money allocated for a case for enforcement. If they haven't got the resources to actually complete the job, that means how many hours are funded. I think we need to ask about the resourcement of it because if they really want to succeed, they have to resource it. When I mean resources, what costs they put at the application. Each job, according to when I listened to the previous chief executive of the district council, when I a meeting said it generates a cost and this is what we've allocated per case and in hours of time and whatever <clears throat> so i think we do need to find out whether they're going to put more re financial resource into enforcement but i think it was probably thought it may have been financed better in other parts of bucks so now we're going to get equipment resource but i think we need to know what the funding is really because if there's no funding we can't expect them to improve can we I think they were short of funding in the district through previous decisions, which we all saw with okay. uh, the planning department debacle when it when lots of people got moved away from planning and it got okay. smaller. Right. So you mentioned about the the money that comes in from planning applications. So were you wanting to know where how that's distributed as to 
how much of that goes to, towards enforcement and how much goes into planning decisions? There, I mean, will, be a, they... there will be a budget <clears throat> generated somewhere within the council what they anticipate the cost of uh, and to how they work the costs out. And we don't yeah. know where, what the costs were and are they anticipating um, putting more money in? Because it wouldn't matter how you change anything. That could be officers, time, money, resource. We need to know how they're going to measure it because the budget that they're allocating to it is the easiest way. It's got the same portion okay. of money in it. Please don't expect any great improvement because you can't only get what you can out of um, a sponge when you squeeze it, can't yeah, you? Yeah, blood out of a stone. <clears throat> you know, yeah. we need to get those sort of things going. I'm happy to... Okay. I mean, else. I can just question how we're on it, but I think it's important that the town council ask those questions. We can ask. I'm sure that'd be fine. We can, Paul, if you want to find out what budget they're allocating towards things like enforcement, and that's okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so 8.2 is who's going to call in. Um, so what ones if, are we opposing? We at Hilltop Avenue. At Hilltop Avenue. And I think that might have been it. And the tree one. But I don't think they take trees to committee anyway. Mm. Okay, so who are we going to ask to do Hilltop? John has I mean, it's, sorry, I mean, just thinking quickly, this will bring us on to the next appendix which will show which shire councillor has called in what application because we were going to try and do it fairly at the beginning weren't we but john i'll take you first well i'm looking at the appendix as well at the same time okay and i know that tim has called is calling one in robin's calling in four um mm -hmm. howard may be calling in the one on tindrick road and warren is calling in the villas which means at the moment we've got several um, several applications um, that actually fall within that, that, that each of their wards. But for example, Simon Cole is not calling in any. Um, Charlie Clare is not calling in any. Um, um, and as I say, Tim Howard and Warren have deigned to call in just one each. Whereas bless him, Robin of course is calling in four. Now. Yeah. In terms of the one, the one that we've actually asked for, that's obviously in the in the bailiwick of Tim, Simon, um, and Warren. I was just on the basis that, they, that, that Tim has called in one, Warren's called in one. We ask Simon to. Yeah, I'm happy to go with that. Yeah. Mark, have you got? Would you yeah, have to I, say I was going to suggest we go to Howard because I'm afraid afraid to say Simon Cole is not really. Uh, doesn't doesn't have his heart in doing this. Everything we put to him, he's he's not been interested, and he's he seems to have misunderstood the process and thinks that it should be called in once it's been refused. This is what mm. we found last time. Howard and Tim both live close to this, uh, to Hilltop, and they both live close to where the um, the trees are. But we're not doing it. Hilltop Avenue. I think because Tim at the moment is chairman of the of that committee, then Howard is the logical man to ask. Okay, so we've got one for Simon and one for Tip. Who say no, Howard? Howard. Oh, Howard. Yeah. Oh. All right, Robin. <laughs> oh, sorry, Paul. Can Robin? Can I just take Paul quickly? Thank you. Yeah, ju just to say in terms of Simon Cole, he has spoken to us quite clearly. His technical view is that it's not appropriate for him to be making any call-ins or any of them to be calling in. Uh, at this stage, so he will always say no because of his technical understanding of the process at the moment. Well, is somebody going to educate him then and what the process is? Because that is not what we know it's, it to be. So he clearly needs some education around the policy that his council put in place. That's just unacceptable yeah. to say that he's not going to look at any of the ones that we ask him to call call in. That's just unacceptable. Mm. So we've got, well, Robin, I'll come to you, but we've got Howard on the table so far. I don't want to say anything about 
silence for reasons. Um, I will say that I have been having good conversations with Tim around these issues. Uh, I'm kind to come to some agreement between us on stuff because of the fact that he's vice chair of the committee. Um, so there's a difference in there with him and, um, and he has to take his own view on everything. I, one of the applications I called in, I called in in advance of you even seeing the application. So you didn't ask me to call it in. I just called it in through my own personal concerns and I weren't sure you were going to get to see the application. And, I, and the other thing is we, we haven't actually had any of the these ones go through the process yet. So they, I understand it. And if Paul reads it different to me, please tell me because it could still go all the way through the process. The member could call it in and it could be deemed by the planning officer mm. and then the chair of the committee or the senior, whichever committee, most of them will be strategic, um, not to be worth a calling. So we could yeah. get to a situation where we don't get to say anything anyway. Yeah. So we haven't tested it. And the only thing I will say on the one calling I was involved in, in the new authority, um, which was called in, to do with inconsistencies to do with a planning application on the industrial estate that took eight months or mm. nine months or whatever and eventually the cabinet member supported my view mm. and that application went through because the cabinet member stepped in and obviously sorted it out so it didn't go on any longer so we've got to test this system out and I don't want to start um individualizing it with people i think they have to answer for themselves why they don't do anything and oh, he not... has that's the problem is he has but answered for himself I, I, think, I, I feel i think we need to um ask in a try and get him to do so because it's untenable yeah in the long run that i've got i cannot call every application no. there'd be a meeting i go to where i spend more time asking questions and i will of yeah. the committee when I will ask you questions of the applicant and that ain't sustainable. Yeah. No, it's not right. Okay, so we've got Howard on the table, but I'll take Paul next. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this business about what Simon's um, interpretation of the rules are, shouldn't we perhaps send that letter to Warren, who's after all the cabinet member in charge of planning, and saying, is this um, interpretation correct because either you've got different interpretations or there is one interpretation and I would have thought the cabinet member in charge of planning ought to be as good as we could get as someone who actually um, determines that. So I suggest that the town clerk writes, I think it would have to be the town clerk, writes mm. to um, uh, um. Warren uh, as um, cabinet member and asks him for his his uh, ruling on this. Yeah, yeah. I don't can't see anybody would object to that one. Um, Could I just be sure we do that in a non personal way? Because what I'm saying is, he's it's his interpretation of it. He's entitled to have an interpretation of what was said to him. If his interpretation is wrong, that's for the cabinet member to determine that he was wrong. Well, it, he is wrong. That's the point. Yeah. He is wrong. But well, I know it's how we write that. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Paul's quite capable of writing yeah, a, a letter, Robin. I, I think it'll be fine. You know. Thank you. So we've got Howard as to who we asked to call this in. Um, can I have a show of hands to it's either him or Simon? And I think we've just got to go with Howard at this point. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Howard it is. Thank you very much. Okay, so Sorry, my cat's moved my agenda around. Right. Okay, 8.3. We've kind of covered that. But would anybody like to speak on 8.3? John. You're yeah, I'm just wondering about the gaps, really. Are the gaps no longer going to be called in? I mean, we're talking of Castle Street. Um, uh, I mean, there are several gaps here. Uh, 13 houses on Morton Road, another gap. Uh, Old Town Hall, another gap. Crone Close, another gap. I mean, there are some, you know, um, 
significant um, applications that we spent probably quite a long time discussing. Are they just going to just disappear into the ether now then? Because ABDC slash um, the planning officers slash Buckinghamshire officers decided that they can't they can't space these out, or they've got a constitution that won't allow us to put them forward. I just think it's appalling. Thanks, John. Catherine? Um, everything except the villas was um, put in a memo by Mrs Kitchen and circulated to the Shire councillors to see which ones they wanted to pick up on. Um, some looked at it, as I said, Howard's, Howard's looking at Station House. Um, Charlie Clare's is only really interested in things in his ward. Mm. But if they don't pick it up and they don't respond when we've asked them to, we're, we are lumbered, basically. Yeah, and that Robin's picked up Osier Way. He's picked up Morton Road 3 because we thought it was just appalling that none of the Shire councillors was going to fight the corner. Yeah. But um, I, it's a shame that the, the grid lines didn't get... Um, printed on this it one. Is. Yeah, it is. I did think that um, it would be easier to read. It, it, was, it was also landscape, not portrait, when it left me, but um, yeah, it, it's easier to see which ones we haven't got. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you on that. But um, I mean, the workshop on Tindrick Road, for example, I had a lengthy phone call with Councillor Simon Cole explaining why it wasn't worth the effort. Similarly, Crone Close. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, I suppose this will come I'm down to when them to do it. No, no. But hopefully, when they evaluate how this call-in process it mm. works with town and parishes, this will be one of the first things that comes to light. Is mm. we are asking our shire councillors to call these in, and they're either point blank refusing or palming them off, saying they're not in our ward. That is not the point. And it clearly, um, Charlie Clare then needs a, a, a bit of a lesson as well as Simon Cole, because it, again, it's just unacceptable. Okay, I can see John and Robin. Okay, okay two points. One is, um, you know, this means that effectively the Shire councils are now marking our work, which means even though we're a democratic, independent uh, body with our own powers and, 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 and so forth, it means that Shire councillors can now decide whether to accept our view or, or not. Yeah. Um, rather than actually allow it to go forward, we're just being told, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to bother with that. So that, for me, is an abrogation of, of democracy that we need to make note of and remember. The second point is, remember, we have a lot more councillors than the ones on this list. I mean, the way they've worked it out, that even, uh, was it... Um, uh, the councillor for Wadden, whose name I can't now, Bevel Stanier, is actually a councillor for um, uh, uh, for for Reading. Um, I'll get there in the end. For Buckingham, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I've got Oxford and Reading in my head. For Buckingham um, uh, East. So why don't we ask Sir Bevel Stanier? Um, let's ask the full list um, of of councillors. If they're going to play games with our democratic decisions, then we'll bloom and play games with their councillor allocations as well. I just think this is shocking. And I just think this is democracy is dying here in Buckinghamshire because they're not listening to us. Yeah, agreed. Paul, I'll come to you first. Uh, without disagreeing with Councillor Harvey, I would just point, remind councillors that we did vote quite recently not to invite councillors who weren't elected to represent Buckingham wards to speak at our meetings. So they might not take too kindly to now us having an expectation for them to take up a role in Buckingham. Mm. Yeah, but they are still, if they're still allowed to be asked to call in an application and our councillors aren't going to do that, then I, I think John's point is completely valid. It our decision doesn't stop us still asking them. Uh, Robin, did you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah. Um, the station road, the station house one, I yeah. said to you at the time when we discussed that, I didn't think, because of circumstances and conversations, it would be appropriate for me to call that in because right. I felt that it would cause a planning issue, period, yeah. because I'd had many conversations with the person 
made no yeah. commitment and no correspondence with the person. And I felt I could be part of the application rather yeah. than contribute to it. I believe we'd asked Councillor Charlie Clare to call that in because that one is in his county stroke Buckinghamshire side. So to say, he, if he says he will do ones in his division, perhaps he doesn't realise Tindrick Road stroke that is in his division because just because it's got a title on it, it doesn't mean that he knows it is. So maybe we should go back to him with that one and point out where it is in the, in, 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 if he's going to work on an electoral map, that it is in his map, what do you reconsider? As for the business of the, what the council does with it, mm. um, I, I, I took a motion to council because of circumstances and the length of the meeting, it never got determined. Councillor Warren White and I were in correspondence during the meeting and before the meeting, trying to find an agreement between me and him on an amendment. But the meeting didn't actually get charged to determine it. So whatever view I had on it and whatever view Warren had it, we were both left frustrated that we were not able to resolve that issue through the democratic process. So just for information, I wrote to Warren last week and, and, to, and through work commitments, he couldn't respond to me straight away. And the weekend has been in the way and he's got the right to a weekend, bless him. What's this uh, about, Robin? What is... It's about what John said about the way that we weren't consulted and the determination of it about consulting. So I've asked about consulting us about the process. We can't change the process of the constitution no. in, in one hit. It's going to take some considerable time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm trying to work with Warren to achieve that because, okay. you know, cool. so that's not, Warren didn't, whatever we think about it, Warren was not in charge of planning. When, no, nobody's blaming Warren no, for anything. Saying, we, so we're trying our hardest. I, yeah. I tried to raise at council, was defeated by the length of the meeting. Um, I don't think they've got another two days to go on to allow me to speak on my motion. As I, but um, but they, we are in conversation. I'm waiting for Warren right. to come back to me, see if okay. we can come to some agreement. Because it's, it, my motion will then go to September's meeting. And yeah. I don't think me, Warren and I are probably in agreement that it needs to have a resolution of what form of consultation will take place before yeah. September. Um, so <laughs> when, we, when right. we, you know, um, because unless we consult wearing that hat, they yep. consult with the parishes. How are we going to identify the weaknesses and plead the case and prove it doesn't work? But at the moment, we've got a con what basically looks to me like we had Wickham District Council's planning policy given to us in the yep. district. And in Wickham District Council, it wasn't... Yeah. They haven't got a town council in Wickham, no, remember? No, we've been, we've been over this so before. So what I'm saying then. is... I don't. I want to try and work with Warren to see if we can yeah. get somewhere forward on this. I don't want yeah, thank to, you. you know. I think we've got to use him wisely. Yeah, no. We succeed. Yeah, I'm thank you. Frustrated with it as anyone else, but of course, but this, so I'm proved different. I'm willing to work with him until yeah. we no. prove you know different. I have to say yeah, that. Thank you, Robin. You know, no, I, 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 I think we're. I think we're all willing to work with Warren. I don't think that's the issue here. I think the issue is, is that we're asking our shy councillors to call in applications and they're point blank, blank refusing um, and, and trying to palm them off. So, um, you know, but we'll, we'll get some letters written about that. I think that's another thing that we should talk to Warren about because he's... Sure. He, he, well, you know, yeah, we've already agreed that. We've already yeah, agreed that, know, that we're going to write to... Those people who aren't pulling their weight or, or we won't feel they are, that's your opinion, you should express it. Yeah, no, we've, we've agreed that Paul's going to write a letter to Warren. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, right, so item nine, the uh, shy committee meetings, both, no, first one was cancelled and the second one, no Buckingham applications. So item 10, enforcement, does anybody get any breaches? I can't see any hands up. No, nope. thank no. you very much. So it's number 11, section 106, quarterly report, appendix F. Would anybody like to say anything on this? Robin's got his hand. Thank you, Robin. One of the things that we're going to have to consider is many of these section 106 
on the date. Now, I'm unclear, and perhaps Catherine can advise me. The Laysill Development, Section 106, I think was agreed in 2009-10. Um, that most of the resources out there, but in that, there was the money to purchase or contribute to health centre. Now, they have time limits on them. Mm -hmm. And if they, do. they don't use that before the time limit's up, the, de the developers can take that money back. Yeah. That, there won't be any contribution to it. Now, that hasn't progressed. The other thing is, of course, we're, we've got a stu stupendously strange thing in Bucks where we're likely to have all the development and we've got um, Section 106, Mm -hmm. and, and the South Bucks, me and Wickham, have got a policy on seal and Chilterns and South Bucks are in the same position as they've got no a policy planning thing not agreed. Now, I have asked questions on what they're going to do and they've said they're going to try and align everything. But okay. if we don't have it all in alignment, um, this historical section 106 is going to be what we're going to deal with. Mm -hmm. And the, as and others might disagree with me, the 2004 um, planning document, Parks and Leisure, it means that many of the things that we want to contribute to going forward, if we get a development which gets passed, um, we ain't going to be able to get anything additional in Buckingham, apart from skate parks and playing fields, because we're still stuck with the same policy. No theatre. Yeah. No television, no, you know, anything like that we might want to do for the Buckingham. So I think we have to over the above this. We need to start a conversation with them about the policy round. Are they going to amend the policy round section one or six if they can? But they're okay, all so your up. first your first point was on a health centre um, yeah, contribution. I, 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 I don't have any clarity on that because if it runs out yeah, of time, thank you. That money's gone. No, absolutely, totally right. Catherine, can you come? Do you you know the answer to the Health Centre one contributions. I don't know the the mechanics of it. I mean, they they've got um, planning permission. It they've got it will run out after three years anyway if they don't actually make a move on the site. Yeah. Um, I will ask David Rowley what the p policy is on that. Having got the approval, does that actually trigger everything, or you know, it. <laughs> It's just something I don't know the mechanics of. Okay. All right, we can bring that back to our next meeting. Um, all right, I saw John's hand got first and then Paul. Okay, well, I think picking up on what Robin said about looking at the policy of what Section 106 money gets spent on is yeah. a really good point. Um, and I think we need, to be, we need to be exploring that now. But yeah. before we start lobbying for change, I think we need to find out what's been happening across the county um, with regards to Section 106 monies. And I'm wondering whether Paul, Town Clerk Paul, can be investigating this via the SLCC to see whether we can find out a bit of intelligence about just what the spread is. Because if we find out that in High Wycombe or in Chesham or wherever, South Bucks, that they've been much more broad with regards to their use of Section 106, then we have begin to actually mm -hmm. have some meat um, to argue for against for a county-wide change that is actually less restrictive than only spending it on sports and leisure. Mm. Paul, are you happy to find out? Yeah, very happy to do that. Thank you very much. Right, Paul Hirons. You're muted, Paul. Only a small thing, but I wonder whether, say, George, whether George Gavriel knows anything about S106 and how it works. And yet he's the one who's putting together the project for the new health centre. I wonder whether it would be good to just do a email to him, just yeah. pointing out that he's only got a certain length of time. Yeah. Does he realise about this? Because he may not realise something. I imagine something could be done about it, but only if you know that the money is going to come to an end. Yeah. And I suspect he doesn't. Good point. Yeah, good point. Mm. Paul. 
So if we could just send him a, a little memo saying, by the way. Yeah. Right, Paul, seven o'clock, Paul. Um, just on, on that, I'm, I will send George a memo. He is working with professionals who are advising him, so I'd be surprised if they're not aware. Um, although I, I don't know the answer. Well, thank you for doing a memo. Much appreciated. Anthony? You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, pressing the wrong space bar. I've got two <laughs> keyboards here. Um, sorry about that. As far as the, the uh, land is concerned over at Lace Hill for the medical centre, do um, George Gavriel and his team actually own that yet, or are they still waiting to actually purchase the land? So in other words, are they still quite a long way down the road before they even um, are able to fund and then purchase the land? I don't know, Paul, 10 o'clock, Paul, do you know? I, I'm not aware they've purchased the land. Hmm. Yeah, okay. So it could be quite far off from that then. Yeah, Robin's right. got a hand. Oh, thank you. Robin? My understanding of that site, by the way, it unwound itself is that all the land still belongs to the original landowner until such time mm. as it's carried through in a development. Because the original site at the front of the development you've got now um, was the site where they had the yard on it for yeah. maintenance for building much of Lay Sill. So um, that was then sold afterwards. So I should imagine without naming the owner, which we know who the owner is, um, it still belongs to him. Mm. Um, and it was Montpellier who were the developers yeah. who brought through all the other applications. Sure. And Montpellier, if you remember, the health centre wasn't originally going to be where it is. It was going mm -hmm. to, it, in the original plans we saw, it was going to be on a different place. And the site was all moved around. Why Montpellier yeah. then brought the first application for the health centre. I hope Mr. Gabriel's getting good advice on this. Um, but my worry is the money being lost to Buckingham. Yeah. Yeah, well. But it was a yeah. contribution. We shouldn't yeah. get Mr. Gavriel's planning application. It's nothing to do with this. It's Section 106 money, which can be drawn down on Buckingham for the use of whatever the land. Yes. Until I'm corrected, it's still up to the owner. There would have to be a, a conclusion of that. It, the land was not included. It was a contribution in the Section 106. I believe it was £180,000. Yeah. to contribute to health. It didn't contribute the land. It was the various yeah. applications were ended up with that. So All I right, can we leave it to Paul to do some digging? We shouldn't really yep. discuss Mr. Gavriel's problem. We're just discussing the Section 106 here. And um, yeah. I only mentioned well, it because I'm worried that the money being lost. Yeah, and no, you're totally right. Yeah, you know, you're totally right, the Robin. Policy that John said, until I'm corrected, each area in the Buckinghamshire will be bound by their own development plans which are in place and we're bound by the Avail's 2004 development plan. Wiccan will be developed by their last and Chilton and South Bucks by theirs. Though we can discuss with them about policies, I think you're bound by the last legally passed We are, yeah, plan. we are. Uh, I think harmonisation of it going forward to way, but I don't think we can suddenly take on policies from Wickham if they're better than ours. No, I don't think, no, you know, I don't I don't think, think John was that. suggesting that. I, I uh, think... I and, that's how I see it. If I'm wrong, I'm happy to be corrected. No, and John can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, he just wanted Paul to find out what the policies are for Section 106 in the different areas, and at some point then to align everybody the same. Am I, in, am I right or wrong, John? That's correct. I'm just saying, let's gather some intelligence before yeah. we start making the point. Because if we can yeah. find out that other council areas, you know, the, 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 the legacy council areas had entirely different policies, we've got a good basis um, uh, on which to argue for something a bit more expensive than we're currently restricted by. Yeah. Thank you. OK, moving on. Item 12. We've got Appendix G. Would anybody like to talk on this one Can't 
can't see any hands up. No, nobody wants to talk on this one. I'll just jump in, um, Chair. I mean, I'm not yeah. sure what we're meant to do other than say, interesting, we don't <laughs> agree with it. Um, yeah. We're going to try and change it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, matters to report, item 13. Has anybody got anything they wish to raise? No? No. Nope. Well, that's good, I have to say. If nobody's got anything to raise on this or enforcement, I think that's a pretty good um, meeting. Okay, I don't have any chairman's items. And date of next meeting is 17th of August, 7 o'clock. Possibly on Zoom. Oh, John, sorry. Sorry, I, I thought we'd made a policy not to have any meetings during August. We take we not? We made the exception for planning because if we don't have mm. it in August, then we're going to miss deadlines. So it's just that one okay. thing that we take. All right. Okay. Yes, we, okay. we did make exception for planning, yeah. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Thanks, John. Okay. Thank Can you. I just thank Chairman for getting through the meeting with no instances. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Robin. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, 